the land trust model is a way for people to not only own housing that's affordable, but then to kind of pass that on to the next buyer who needs affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So essentially just kind of recycling that affordability from one family to the next. And so because housing, the access to housing is becoming more and more challenging, um, people are, look, are willing to consider um, the idea of the community land trust model and the idea of not owning the land and the idea of sharing equity uh, with the next buyer. In November of 2019, we actually had our vote on Resolution 126R19, which was to establish reparations for the black community in Evanston using the cannabis sales tax revenue. There were a lot of different recommendations and we narrowed that down to what today is a $25,000 direct benefit for housing equity that will build wealth immediately um, through equity. And the deposit base for a public bank are the taxes, the fees, the fines, the funds, the revenue that our city accrues, which then leverages to, to create loans just like any other bank. But the, the difference between a public bank and a private bank is with public bank, the interest and profit belongs to the community. So rather than it gets siphoned out of state by private Wall Street bankers and private shareholders, that money stays here. African American mutual aid started pretty much on the boats when we were dragged here forcibly in chains. Um, we were helping each other even though on the boats we were, um, the, the captors wouldn't even let people who spoke the same language or who were from the same community be chained together. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that kind of mutual aid and camaraderie is really incredible when you think about it, whether it was supporting a whole group to jump overboard, whether it was supporting a group to have a resurrection, or whether just surviving the trip over here. So from then, we had this sense, I think probably from the way that African cultures had also had a sense of mutuality and mm -hmm. communal. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we practiced it wherever we could. The Greater University uh, Circle Initiative was incorporated um, as a place-based strategy working with the anchors. And at that time we were looking at employee-assisted housing, we were looking at how to create jobs, so again the Evergreen Co-ops wasn't on the table at that mm -hmm. time, but quickly became the one thing everybody could get behind. Mm -hmm. And then um, also looking at, you know, procurement and high quality schools. So it's a, a comprehensive initiative um, to really revitalize the neighborhoods in a different way. The model is, is such that no less than 80% of the, the ownership or the equity of any of those businesses uh, uh, is, is held by the employee owners. Wow. So there can never be a a dilution event of any sort, no private equity or outside investment that, um, you know, that might take that ownership level down. Once an employee becomes an employee owner, which is a one year eligibility period, and then he or she is voted upon by the existing worker owners, so that's step one, okay. um, they immediately begin to build equity in the company. They're immediately fully vested for profit sharing. We have, um, community land trusts. We have our Freedom Farms Co-op. We have our Green Team Cooperative. Uh, and we have our uh, Community Production Cooperative. But, but the main thing, just so folks know that it is actually working on is now is learning how to produce housing, right? Like different types of 3D print housing. The other thing that really bothered me was that uh, there were some law students who were clerking at large law firms in the summer who were also on the tour with us, who asked the officers to make people incarcerated fight for their entertainment multiple times. Um, and I just was floored by the inhumanity in that request. I thought to myself, there, there are people in this jail who can't afford not to be. There are people in this jail who will be acquitted of whatever they can charge them. But more importantly, there are human beings here. Sorry. Um, and I just was struck by 
callousness of that request, but also the power that was associated with it. Because like it or not, lawyers do have a certain level of standing in this society, right? They have a certain level of access to power. Um, and I thought, wow, these are future lawyers. And if this is what they think about people who are incarcerated in jails, uh, we're in trouble. Uh, the Southern Center, our mission is to work for equality, dignity, and justice for people impacted by the criminal legal system in the Deep South, where we are. Uh, we work to end mass incarceration, the criminalization of poverty, racial injustice, and the death penalty. Are you saying you won all four cases? Right. Congratulations. Well, thank you. That must make you feel awfully good. You can smile now. Well. You know? <laughs> I mean, the first case that I had in the Supreme Court was a young man named Antonio Madeo. Many years after the trial, uh, and actually after the case had been upheld, uh, we discovered that the prosecutor had written a memo uh, to the jury commissioners telling them to underrepresent black people in the jury pools. Uh, at that time, the law was that uh, if an underrepresentation was greater than 10%, you assumed that there was discrimination, but as long as it was 10% 10, 10 or less, you assume, well, there's just, you know, the percentages aren't going to always work out exactly every time. So he told the jury commissioners, I represent blacks exactly 10%, thinking that this would, you know, avoid any challenge later on. Uh, remarkably, the Georgia courts uh, upheld that. Uh, the Federal uh, Court of Appeals in Atlanta upheld that. This man was going to be executed. Uh, and uh, we sort of threw a Hail Mary pass uh, at the Supreme Court and we sought to get the case reviewed and to our, our thank goodness they granted it. Uh, I argued the case there in 1988 uh, and the Supreme Court saw it very differently. We got a, a unanimous opinion written by Thurgood Marshall. Public defenders are hand handling 300, 400, 500 felony cases, 600 mis uh, misdemeanor cases. And our whole profession, and I want to be clear on this, trial judges, this happens in front of them every single day, and they see it, okay? Um, so state Supreme Court judges, the bar associations, the bar disciplinary uh, committees, uh, the state Supreme Courts, the United States Supreme Court, everybody knows this. I'll state it in its simplest terms. Lawyers may not represent more clients than they can competently represent. I can tell you in one of our offices we had what was called a wait list. So if you applied for services in our office, there weren't enough attorneys to take all the cases. So if you were not confined, your case would be put on a list and you would be told, we will get to you when we have an attorney available. I was checking the numbers on that office's wait list recently and saw that it was gone. And I called the attorney who runs the office and I said, where's your wait list? I, I can't find it. It's not in the database. And she said, well, we don't have it anymore. I'm like, what do you mean you don't have it? How did you do that? She said, you gave me two more attorneys. That's how I did it.